with my paintings. I was trying to resemble when I was tagging and doing graffiti out in the streets at like graffiti yards. I sort of collaged or made these worlds collide in my paintings. I make what I want to see. When it comes to graffiti art, there's one man who's created a niche for himself and crafted a distinguished career. Gajin Fujita, a Los Angeles artist. He has been recognized nationally and internationally for his murals and museum installments. And he's created his own unique brand by fusing ideas and images from the East and West. And in doing so, he's been able to also express his LA and Japanese roots. We are so delighted to have him in studio. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Gajin Fujita, welcome. Thank How are you. you today? Thank you, I'm doing good. So you are an artist from East Los Angeles and you were part of the LA Graffiti Cruise Kill to Succeed and Kids Gone Bad. Yes, um, I was uh, first in KGB, okay. which is Kids Gone Bad. And then uh, Kill to Succeed, an older crew from LA, um, like 1984, 85. And they used to paint around the Belmont High School, just west of downtown. I mean, you, but you started this when I would say graffiti art was pretty much in its infancy. You were probably in middle school and yes. hanging out with these crews. I pretty much saw the infancy of hip hop. No way. The wave hit out here from the East Coast, like in 82, 83. Up until then, we were listening to rock and roll music, uh, Iron Maiden, Ozzy Osbourne. But then hip hop was something super interesting with breakdancing, graffiti, and the emceeing and rapping. It all came into form out here in the West, like 84, 85. There's no way to stop it. It's just, it's just living. When you talk about is it art or is it vandalism, it's really not that simple. It's a very complex discussion. And it is, in the eyes of some, certainly vandalism. And in the eyes of many others, it is an art form. And it is one, and it is the other, and it is both at the same time. These young people can uh, do things with a spray can that are rather remarkable. So. I think in looking at the whole subject right up front, you need to understand that a, an art form has developed. What's been so unique about your artwork, you've used the ukiyo-e Yes. Um, tr the style, I would say, right? Which is a Japanese style. And you fuse that kind of with Western urban imagery. Tell me, tell us a little bit about what this style entails and how you are using it for your art. Well, so ukiyo-e is uh, a woodblock print from Japan. My mom, actually my parents were first to introduce it to me and my brothers. And um, I felt that that was, uh, when I first saw it, it was so vivid and so saturated and rich with color, it, it blew my mind. To date, I think one of your most complicated paintings is Invincible Kings of This Mad Mad World, uh. which took five months to make. Five, six months. Five, yeah. six months, and it's um, eight by 16 feet. So what was the inspiration behind that and why did you want to share that message with people? My inspiration came from actually uh, tattoos that the Yakuza's in Japan, the old Yakuza's in Japan would wear. They would have their whole back covered with um, the, ch the Chinese lion ta in tandem with the peony flowers or surrounded by the peony flowers to symbolize strength, protection, and that was the thing that inspired me for this painting. Yeah. You've been doing this for a long time, Gajin, and you 
especially with graffiti art, you're very familiar with it. How do you think the perception of graffiti art has changed in Los Angeles? There's been um, some huge uh, graffiti street art shows. Uh, one that happened here at MOCA in 2011. Um, and those, I think, those shows must have impacted a great deal on the views and perception of graffiti, I, be I believe. I'm glad that there's this huge trend and popularity of street art. One of the greatest pieces that uh, can now be shared with people in their pockets is the library card and this yes. is a special edition. But for me, I understand that this isn't just art for you because you actually have a special connection to the LA Public Library. So it extends beyond just creating the image that you recently did. Yeah, I used to frequent the library, my local library in Boyle Heights, uh, the Robert Louis Stevenson Library. I learned about color, I learned about composition, I learned about aesthetics, diving into these books at the library. You know, I, I feel very privileged and honored that my image was uh, chosen to go on the face of the LA Library Card. I feel like Ben Franklin on the C note or something. <laughs> yeah. It's because the figure is wearing a Los Angeles Dodgers logo. You think that's why you got picked? Of course! As artists, our brains are always thinking and there's different things coming to mind um, but we can also get stumped <laughs> yes. and, right because you're like okay I've done this now what do I do next yeah because you what keeps you inspired so that you want to continue to create and when you do your most recent one you're not like oh this is it I'm done but no I have this fire in my heart that still burns to make more well I think I've been able to um, garner a few fans. I'm inspired by bringing to them the next excitement. Have you along your journey had any artists or any individuals um, either from Japan or here as local artists that have inspired you for your work? As far as visual aesthetics, uh, yeah, like the Renaissance masters, um, someone that's post-Renaissance, I've been really um, looking at and studying a lot recently is Caravaggio from Italy. He's known as the evil genius. <laughs> uh, someone that I studied a lot and he's super popular is Yoshitoshi. It's like the fifth street bridge out in Hiroshima and um, it quickly made a reference to me of the bridges that I used to go over every day while going to high school from East LA to West Hollywood because I went to Fairfax High so I would have to cross the bridges every day. These are among some of the artists that I draw a great deal of inspiration from. This has been so much fun just learning about your work, your inspiration, so thank you again. Thank you.
1960 census does the job that in earlier censuses required the services of 2,000 card punch operators. In 80 million mailboxes across the USA, the census is a coming to help us plan the way, to show us where we're going so that we can understand what's needed for the future, the future of our land. Can we count on you? You can count on me. Can we count on you? You can count on me. Can we count on you? You can count on me. Answer the census. We're counting on you. Answer the census. We're counting on you. Hello and welcome to LA Currents. I'm Anita Bennett. Today we're talking about Census 2020. Are you a citizen of the United States of America? Oh, gee. I'm sorry, I just can't answer that question. There used to be a time when you could proudly declare, I am a citizen of the United States. Now they're trying to erase the very existence of a very important word and a very important thing, citizenship. Talking to people in the community, there are still some concerns about responding. This has gone back and forth in the courts. What, what can you tell people to allay those fears about citizenship questions? So as of right now, that is not on the table as part of this census. Um, I think given the pattern of behavior of uh, this president and, and its administration, I understand and recognize uh, that I think it was with their intention to try and prohibit people from participating or inhibit people from participating. And people should not be afraid. No. Look, don't worry. Your name and answers will be kept absolutely secret. That's the law. Everyone needs to participate in census because this is a critical source of revenue for the state of California, for the city of Los Angeles. It touches everyone. Every single time you get one more person to fill out a census form, that's worth two thousand dollars. And that's all we're asking for is to get our fair share back. Not money that's Washington's money we produced with our labor and our hard work that we send to Washington and that we demand in a democracy comes back to us. That's why we are here. So what does a census mean for the city of LA? So in the city of Los Angeles, the census data plays a critical role for not just uh, the way we distribute resources in the city of Los Angeles, namely, for example, LAPD cars, is determined by our census counts. This is how we determine the level of uh, uh, officers get deployed and assigned to those areas. Uh, but more importantly, each member of our community in the city of Los Angeles, that when they're counted, they are worth an estimated $1,900 in federal funds that come to our city to help support our infrastructure, our roads, our, uh, you know, those critical programs at the elementary schools and uh, at, you know for public schools so they're really important to make sure that we get an accurate count so that we get our fair share of federal resources in addition to that it also clearly plays an important role in determining how many representatives we have in congress population figures since 1790 have determined the number of delegates from each state in the house of representatives and so these are some very uh, important numbers because with the population that we have in Los Angeles, making sure that everyone counts is an important part of making sure that we get the resources that our city deserves. So how do you get people to take part? How do you get the word out? So the mayor's office, uh, uh, mayor has a census office that is working on a larger outreach strategy with a number of community organizations, the California Community Foundation. We are working very uh, collaboratively also with um, the uh, our county partners because we understand how important it is for us to make sure that we have a, a good accurate census count we are one of the hardest to count areas and so that has uh, created a circumstance for us that we know puts us at a disadvantage of getting the full share of resources that we're deserving of the best place to get information about the entire population is the place where the people sleep but there will be some places that will be hard to find Making sure that we are doing an effective outreach strategy is going to play a huge part in making sure that we get everyone counted. In particular, because this, uh, the effort that's being deployed in this census count is relying predominantly on an online portal 
for people to submit their data. And with the digital divide and so many families in lower socioeconomic conditions not having access to a lot of technology, it's going to, it creates another hurdle uh, mm -hmm. for us to try and get an accurate census count. So you say online, in the past we were able to fill this long thing out by mail, has that changed? So they're, what they're doing, the federal government is doing um, this time around is that they are really at, they're uh, pushing this online portal for everybody to go online and fill out uh, their data and there are going to be mailings of postcards to remind everybody mm. that they should be participating in the census count. They will be receiving three notices uh, to participate in the, into the census count. Uh, it's on the fourth try that they will then mail a paper copy but we don't want you to wait for that fourth time. We need everybody to go online, and so we are uh, in the process of creating stations at local grammar schools, at clearly our libraries, where they'll be able to fill that information out. You can do it on your smartphone. Uh, it's going to be available everywhere. You represent Council District 7. Can you just tell me some of the communities there? Yes, so I proudly represent the 7th District, which represents the Northeast San Fernando Valley and the communities of Pacoima, Mission Hills, North Hills, Sunland, Tahunga, Silmar, mm -hmm. Shadow Hills, and Latuna Canyon. Mm -hmm. The majority of my area and the area that I represent has uh, historically been undercounted, and so it's really important that we do our due diligence. There is far too much money uh, and resources that these communities are uh, deserving of that we can't afford not to be counted. Based on the populations uh, of our areas, of our geographic areas, this is, this is the data that is used. So when we want to talk about equity and making sure that everyone gets their fair share, I need everybody to pay very close attention to this process and participate. Good information, there's a trickle down effect. There really is. Wow, there was just a census report in the city council, correct? Correct, so we just went through uh, you know, all of the investments that we're making and the outreach strategies that we're deploying because we wanna get everyone primed for that spring uh, kickoff. Can you walk me through the calendar for the census? March 12th is when that online portal will be available mm -hmm. uh, and we have a finite window for people to participate on that online portal and that's going to extend through July 31st. So it's just a it's a very abbreviated timeline so we want to make sure it's one of those things that you know it's kind of like doing your homework when you're in high school. The sooner you get it done the sooner you go out and have fun. It's just an easier thing for you to just handle take care of the minute that it's available so that we can get everyone counted in the city of Los Angeles. And for more information, we have a website, which is census.lacity.org. We are all very concerned in making sure that our communities are, are counted. And once again, that is census.lacity.org. So what can we do to get involved? So um, there is going to be a volunteer core that helps to support outreach efforts. There are a number of local nonprofit organizations that uh, have been selected to assist and lead some of those outreach efforts in those areas. So again, I would encourage uh, going to the website and identifying what opportunity is going on in your local area so that you can participate. You're also encouraged to contact your local council office. They're happy to connect you. Uh, my office is heavily involved in this process because I wanna make sure that everyone in my community gets counted. And so we're, uh, we're, we're very involved, like most offices are, to make sure that uh, that we can connect the volunteers to participate and support this effort. And the census won't just be in English, correct? Correct. Hola, soy Efraín Herrera de los Seattle Seahawks y esta es mi familia. The Asian Pacific American community especially is a large and growing and diverse one. We need an accurate count of our communities. Rosas ot sexo, which means, please, answer the census. It counts for more than you think. There are going to be 12 languages, and the, some of the most common, you know, English, Spanish, uh, Korean, it's going to be uh, available in a wide variety of uh, languages. So we, again, are trying to make it very accessible for everyone to participate. And that does it for this edition of LA Currents. I'm Anita Bennett. Thank you for joining us. You cannot know your country unless your country knows you. Catherine Bigelow! Now we have all of these women directors who are being nominated. So, you know, I think it's fair. I finally think it's starting to kind of even out and be fair. And that's exciting to see that over all these years. And a lot of the press was saying, 
okay, this changes everything, and uh, all the times that that's happened, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. We never seem to get any momentum going. This is a risk-averse industry, and they, they do what is comfortable and what is safe because there's such a high price point on the line. We need to see uh, directors uh, from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups being hired, women being hired behind the camera, and a value placed on inclusive stories. But the whole system has to change so that the endpoint can look different as well. Susan Durende, you started an all-female film festival entitled Broad Humor 14 years ago. There must have been some really interesting reason why you decided, oh, okay, I just think I'll start a film festival. I had written scripts and was doing my own work in films, and I was part of women in film, and I saw work in by other women, but I liked the work by other women, but wasn't getting into festivals. Mm -hmm. And one thing I know about women is women are funny, mm -hmm. and yet you wouldn't know that women are funny, or certainly not then, so I said, I'm going to start a festival of women's humor. So. I wanted written and directed by women both. I went to a women's organization at the time that shall remain nameless, which since folded, and asked them if we could, if they were interested in working with me on this. They said, you can't do written and directed by women. There aren't any good ones. I want to see more films by women. Okay, I'll start a film festival. It needs doing, and so we did it. It was very small to begin with. It's grown a lot, and the number of films we've gotten have grown. The, the landscape has changed you know, in women's humor. Okay, so cut to 14 years later, <laughs> is the fact that it's not just a once a year festival, it has become a community, and so I would imagine that must be very fulfilling for you. What's fulfilling is that I left five years ago the day-to-day -day running of the festival, and it's still going on. That is basically Ocean's Eleven meets <laughs> Top Gun for women. Well, well, it's really, Wait, it's I really see good. The first page. We are a festival that it's about uh, giving women opportunities. It's a four-day event. Uh, we screen short films. We screen features, web series. We have a screenwriter's brunch. We also have a stage reading. All the broads are volunteers. You know, everybody uh, spends the time because a, it's labor of love. Uh, B, half of us are filmmakers, so we know what it's like to be on the outside looking in. This is one of the things that makes my life richer, is to be able to give the hand to young and even seasoned marinated women. They're trying to actually get their voices heard. We really have s such a huge yeah. meter of comedy. Yeah. Like when we first started, remember, it was just this like real broad humor, like slapstick, remember? Mm -hmm. Broad humor is important because it is still, after 14 years, the only comedy film festival in the world for women writer, women director, filmmakers. It's a good problem that we have now where we have so much women's content that's funny mm -hmm. that we actually have to have, you know, these knock down <laughs> discussions about this one should get in and this one no. My first film that screened there was Confessions of a Reluctant Bra Buyer and when this short screened that brought humor so many years ago to hear the people laugh and congratulate me after so that was just something that I'll, I'll never forget. It is definitely validating when a film festival accepts your short. What is a broad? You know, it's from the beginning, what I think it is, is um, someone who's gone through the festival, who's submitted, who's been, uh, who's now an alum of the festival, and who's a, a comedy female filmmaker. Coming to you directly from my mother's basement, this is Zoraya Cruz. We are now in the thick of day 13 post-apocalypse without any television or streaming devices. And all I can do is document what transpires here in the hopes that someday humankind can bring back television. Mija, I folded your laundry. Ma, I'm filming now. I went through hundreds and hundreds of festivals and I just wanted to find something very specific. Woman, funny, Latina. I just loved the, the log line. 
It says, women write, women direct, everyone laughs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. I have a friend who I literally chased her down in class and I was like, you need to submit to this festival. Yeah, whenever whenever somebody asks about advice, oh, which ones should I submit to that are female? Like, oh, I, I, I say yeah. this yes. one. Uh -huh. um, especially because of the, the comedy aspect. Yeah. I have never been in a room full of female filmmakers. Like, we, we are the majority, you mm -hmm. know? And it just, I, I was so, I felt so supported and it was such an enriching experience that I'm like, well, I'm coming back. I'm gonna be submitting all the time. Going to see everybody's films and everybody's web series, that was inspiring to me. Yeah. To get to see that quality of work yeah. and then be like, I was included in this quality of work. Like, yeah. oh, that makes me feel special. And I also, it was inspiring to watch other people's things. Yeah. And I left so energized. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. all these Same. women creators. Like I had never seen that before. So I was just so excited to yeah. be with other women creators that were like not a Shonda Rhimes, but that were actually yeah. like, we were all on the same level yeah. and we could yeah. compare notes and it was, I yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, watching a video of Susan, the, the founder, and she was saying, and I mean, this applies for me, I don't know about everybody else, but she was saying that every scientific thing we notice about conversation and what women do is that they change in the presence of men. So a script written by women and men, I figured, would be different. Or a woman's script directed by a man wouldn't have that female something that's there because it's just clear that when there's one man in a group of six women, the conversation changes. Okay. I'm a little bit, uh, when there's a man, I'm like, oh, there's a man, you know, I'm not, I'm not scared of them, but it's like, <laughs> I feel like, like there's a kinship and a sisterhood when, yes. when it's all women. Yes. Yeah. So to me, that feels like a very safe space to yes. be able to, um, less intimidating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You should drop your guard. Especially Definitely. in a place that's, you know, film with directing and writing, which is primarily dominated by, by men. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also then comedy which there's that old friend, women aren't, women can't be funny. Yeah. But it, no, not at all true. <laughs>